so the, the last of these short lectures for today, um, we're going to talk about sequence stratigraphic models that we can apply to shallow marine strata. We've already touched on this when we talked about para sequences. Um, we, we talked about those in the context of fascist models that we can relate to shallow marine deposits in which fluvial wave or tidal processes are dominant. And we're going to build on that a little bit now. So we're going to start off by thinking about regressive systems. So, you know, what are the kind of uh, types of surface that we can generate during regression? There's two important things here. So when relative sea level is falling, there's two places that we can call, we can, we can have erosion. So one is at the base of rivers. Um, so we can have regressive erosional surfaces cut by rivers or fluvial erosion. Those can cut deeply into underlying shallow marine deposits and they will tend to cut valleys. So the river cuts downwards and then if there's sufficient time, the river can migrate laterally and build a, a wide valley. Those valleys can be cut by rivers, but they can be filled later on during transgression. So the fill of the valleys and the geometry of the valleys can be modified by later drowning. In a vertical section, what we expect to see at the base of a valley is an abrupt shallowing. We have rocks that record deep water depths below and they are abruptly overlain by rocks that record much shallower water depths. So one example might be where we have offshore mudstones, for example, or lower shore face deposits, and they are abruptly overlain by fluvial deposits. And we're missing the, the upper shore face, you know, there's an abrupt shallowing. Valleys don't occur everywhere, they have a limited lateral extent, and once we get beyond the margins of a valley, we might expect to see evidence for um, a long pause in deposition. We might expect soils to form for a long period at the margins of the valley and develop paleosols. The margins of the valley we can refer to as interflues. These are areas in between different sections of a valley or between different valleys. Okay, so those are surfaces cut by rivers. We can also, if we're lowering relative sea level, we can also generate erosion by waves or tides, for example. Um, particularly common for waves, if we lower sea level, we also lower wave base. And we can cut uh, you know, re regressive surfaces of erosion um, cut by marine processes. So they're characterized typically by what's referred to as a sharp based shore face and I'll show you an example later on. Again the key thing here is that we have missing fascist belts. We have relatively deep deposits, um, deep water deposits, for example offshore mudstones and they're directly overlain by shallow water deposits. So for example upper shore face and we're missing a fascist belt, we're missing the lower shore face. So exactly, again, in a vertical section, there's this abrupt shallowing, a shift in the fascies, and we're missing fascies here. Now, both of those types of surface cut are cut during a fall in relative sea level. Um, it's a bit academic as to which of those we say is a sequence boundary. That depends a little bit on context. Um, I would it depends a little bit on the data you're using and which surface is easier to recognize and to trace around. Probably generally the base of valleys is uh, is a little bit easier to pick, but it does depend on the type of data you're working with. Okay, so let me talk to the, the model for the fluvial erosion and formation of valleys. And what we're seeing here are a series of, of four cross sections um, these are cross sections perpendicular to the, uh, the, the plan view of river. So basically, um, 
we're, we're cutting at 90 degrees to the orientation of a river. In the middle here, we have sea level curves, relative sea level curves. One, two, three, four, four of these for each of the cross sections. And on the right hand side here, we've got a cross section which is perpendicular to the shoreline. So this is recording the cross section from um, landward to base on the left to basinwood on the right. So we start off um, at the bottom here. So relative sea level is high, then it falls uh, down to the right. So this would be basically be the falling stage systems tract. And what happens here is the rivers cut downwards. So if we take a cross section, we basically have, this would have been the, the land surface before we had any erosion. The river cuts down and it cuts a, a valley. If we take a cross section from landward to basin, what we see is the shoreline. This is our high stand shoreline deposit. And that shoreline is pulled out into the basin and it, it down steps, steps downward as relative sea level falls. Okay, let's move up to the second stage here. So here, um, relative sea level is, is reaching its lowest point and it's, it's starting to rise, but slowly. So this corresponds to the low stand systems tract. And in this case, we start to infill the valley and we infill the valley with, with the deposits of, of rivers. It's worth noting that individual river channels here are much smaller than the overall size of the valley. And those individual river channel deposits are densely stacked. So they cut into one another. We develop what we might think of or describe as a multi-story, so vertically stacked and multilateral, laterally stacked series of channel fill deposits. If we look at the shoreline here, uh, the shoreline is basically building up. Um, it's a grading. This, this corresponds to the, the low stand wedge part of a, a low stand systems tract. Okay, third diagram here, sea level is now rising and it's rising fast. So this corresponds to the transgressive systems tract. And here we start to see drowning of the valley in its upper part. So we might start to see marine deposits or marine influence within the upper part of the valley fill. If we think about the shoreline, the shoreline is stepping back towards the landward direction. So that's from right to left in this cross section. The final picture here, this would be sea level still rising, but rising more slowly and reaching its highest point. This would be the high stand systems tract. And in this model, what we're seeing is that the valley is now completely filled and we have fluvial deposits, fluvial channel fills, the floodplain in between them. Those are, um, those are occurring above the valley fill. If we think about what happens at the shoreline, that would be building up vertically and then building out. So a grading and then prograding. So this is a model for, for valley fills, how they form and how they're filled. So again, just to emphasize some of the key features of valley fills, um, what, how do you recognize them? Well, one thing is we want to look at their context. And ideally that means having multiple vertical sections which allow us to see what happens inside the valley and what happens outside the valley. So we expect the valley fill to be cut into high stand systems tract deposits. So we might see underlying power sequences having a progradational stacking pattern and the valleys to be infilled and maybe overlain by transgressive systems tracts. So basically the valley, the upper part of the valley fill or the sides of the valley to be associated with, um, with retrogradation or backward stepping of, of power sequence patterns. We also expect to see uh, this abrupt basinwood fasci shift. That is if we take a vertical section through the valley fill. That's often expressed as an increase in grain size um, and uh, a change in the fasci's character from relatively deep below to relatively shallow above and with missing fasci's in between those. 
obviously recognizing that requires us to have a good understanding of a fascist model that we're applying to this system. If we're looking for missing, missing fascists, then we have to have a good model of what fascists could be missing. Okay, the third point here is that the base of the valley can cut down deeply and it can erode out time markers in underlying deposits. So it could be that it erodes out, say, flooding surfaces in the underlying units, and those flooding surfaces will, surfaces will be present away from the valley. Those flooding surfaces could be associated with biostratigraphic markers, for example. So we, we could be missing um, indicators of, of, of time within the section because they've been eroded out at the base of the valley. The fourth point, point here, the final thing, as I showed in the model before, the valley fill is not made just of one single river channel. It's made up of, of vertically stacked channel bodies. And those, the stacking of those bodies is dense in the lower part of the valley fill. Lots of cross cutting of, of channels into each other. And as we move upwards, we see greater preservation of the, of the fluvial channels. We might also expect to see t uh, tidal influence or marine influence towards the top of the valley. So there's some distinctive internal architectures, internal stacking patterns within the valleys that we expect to be able to see. Okay, those are things we might expect to see if we have cores or well logs. How about if we're looking within seismic data? Well, in seismic cross sections, we might see deep erosion, but typically valleys are in the order of 20 to 30 meters in thickness. And that tends to be a little bit too small to see in many seismic data sets. But if we're looking, if we're using a 3D seismic data set, we can look for maps through valleys. And this is a seismic time slice through Pleistocene. So very shallow valley, incised valleys, um, offshore Thailand. So what you can see in here, sorry, this is a bit of a grainy image, but the medium gray color is material outside of the valley. Here's the margins of the valley. It's picked out by this dark gray color. The valley fill itself is this pale white color. And you can see there's a channel running through the middle again in, in gray. So this channel in the middle, that, that's one single river, okay? The valley itself, uh, the valley fill itself and the white color is much wider than that river. And if we look at these dark regions, the, the margins of the valley, what we can see is they're forming tributaries, smaller rivers that drain into the valley. And that tributary network is really characteristic of valleys. So if you can see that kind of geometry, then that's really good evidence that we're, we're interpreting a valley fill. Okay, now I, I said that valleys can be filled during transgression, and I also said that they can contain evidence for marine processes. And drowned river valleys are often expressed as estuaries. So an estuary occurs near the mouth of a river. So here we're looking at a, at a map. We have the river here, and the mouth of that river is forming, a, a, it's widening outwards to form a, a funnel shaped geometry. And the mouth of that funnel is, uh, is where we have marine processes in the form of waves or tides. Um, so that's basically what we're thinking about as an estuary. Um, estuaries, because they tend to form during transgression, so drowning of river valleys and then associated retreat of the shoreline, they tend to rework marine sediment and to move it into the mouth of the valley fill. Um, we have a central part of the estuary which tends to have a rather low energy. You know, um, most of the marine energy occurs at the mouth of the, of the estuary. Most of the river energy occurs in the inner part of the estuary and the central part of the estuary tends to be fairly, have a fairly low energy. We can see that in this bottom diagram which basically is, a, is showing the energy level as we go from the mouth of the estuary up into its inner part in here. 
marine processes dominate in the outer part of the estuary and they decrease as we move upstream so in this direction uh, river influence um, and, and river energy is high in the inner part of the estuary and it decreases as we move in a basement direction to give us this sort of profile in here and the central part of the estuary labeled here as mixed energy you can see it tends to have a fairly low energy level so to to, to give you a, a, I guess a little bit of a feel for the fasces associated with an estuary here again is a, is a schematic map this is showing the mouth of the estuary um, then the estuary getting narrower as we move upstream into the, the fluvial section, the river itself. So the river in the inner estuary is associated with um, with meandering, a, sing, a single narrow channel, for example. Um, and often we, we might see subtle evidence for tidal processes. So for example, here you can see there's cross beds indicating period currents towards the left, but some subordinate ones indicated by ripples here towards the right. This central part of the estuary, remember this is where we have low energy, that's often associated with muddy intervals, that can be a lagoon where we have mixing of, of fresh water from the river and marine water coming from the seaward end of the estuary. Um, so yeah, a central estuarine lagoon. And the mouth of the estuary if we're dealing with a system with high wave energy we can have a barrier island and tidal inlets uh, associated with that barrier island so this would look very similar to a barrier island outside of an estuary it just happens to be occupying the mouth of this drowned river valley okay so just to summarize estuaries they're funnel shaped embayments with a river on their inner end they're commonly formed by drowning river valleys and they, they, they're associated with transgressions. So they, they tend to trap both fluvial and marine sediment. If we think about the vertical succession through an estuary, well, typically we have some fluvial sandstones at the base. They record you know, the time when the, when the river was cutting down and actively cutting the valley. The inner part of the estuary uh, those river deposits are overlain by the inner part of the estuary. Um, that's where rivers are dominant, but there might be some subordinate tidal influence. We pass upwards into uh, this, this lagoonal or central estuarine deposits, which tend to have mixed energy um, and often low energy. And then the outer part of the estuary might cap the succession and in a wave dominated estuary, that would be we'd be looking for the, the deposits of a barrier island. Just one sort of final point to say is, you know, the deposits we can see in here, they can vary as we go from the axis of the estuary down out towards the margins. Okay, so in 3D, we can get quite a complex arrangement of fascias within the estuary. So just some examples of incised valley fills. So here you're looking at a cliff face which is about um, about 100 meters in height there's a number of of shallow marine sandstones deposited by wave dominated shore faces these are these um, sheet like sandstones over the scale of the outcrop they have these white tops to them um, and they're capped by coals so we can see one two three four five of these um, shore face units each one of those is a power sequence and we can see that that you know in the in the left hand part of the photo that that third shore face unit is basically cut down deeply um, by a channel and in fact that channel cuts down it completely cuts out this third um, power sequence and it rests directly on top of the second power sequence Within that fine grained interval, we can see there are channelized sand bodies, but you know, the larger erosional feature in here is bigger than those channelized sand bodies. So this is interpreted to be a valley fill in here. It, in this case, it's predominantly muddy, but we can see deep erosion 
and we can also see it's filled by smaller scale channel fill deposits. A few more examples. So this is an example from the subsurface. So on the left hand side, we've got a core, uh, a core log, core description, gamma ray log, neutron density uh, combination of logs. The yellows in here are shore face sandstones. So there's an upward coarsening succession all within the lower shore face. The red in here is fluvial and fluvial with some tidal influence. And this is difficult to demonstrate in a single vertical section, but this, this fluvial unit has been mapped out to be regionally extensive. It has fluvial deposits at the base. So here's the contact, lower shore face sandstones below, fine grained, medium grained, poorly sorted fluvial sandstones above, including quite a bit of uh, carbonaceous material, plant fragments. That's this contact in here. And as we move towards the top, we're still seeing, you know, cross bedded sandstones, but in here we can see there are mud drapes, clay drapes in here. And that's subtle evidence for tidal influence. So this sand body here in red has fluvial at the base, tidal above. So it fits quite nicely with some of the criteria for an incised valley. The key thing here would be to look at neighboring wells and to tie this to seismic data. Can, you know, valleys are expected to be laterally extensive over several kilometers. So do we see similar things in neighboring wells? Can we see in, in seismic data evidence for deep erosion or the sort of plan view network of a valley which I showed earlier? Okay, so the other thing about valleys is they don't they don't continue everywhere they have margins so if we're looking outside of the valley field we might expect to see a well-developed paleosol a well-developed soil and that soil forms the whole time that sea level is falling and we're cutting the valley and it's still forming as sea level rises and we fill the valley so that gives us the potential to have a lot of time to develop this this soil so how might we what might we look for there? Well, we might expect the soil to be occur above a high stand systems tract, so to, to occur above a progradational para sequence set, and to be overlain by transgressive systems tract deposits. Um, so context is important. The, the soil, the paleosol, it represents a long time period, and that means that there might be features that record that long time of development. It could be a mature or a very, very well-developed paleosol. And that paleosol might also look unusual in the context of soils in the overlying and underlying succession, particularly because that soil would have been sitting relatively high compared to where the groundwater was. Remember sea level falls and our soils are sort of they're perched above the level of the sea level and the groundwater. So it could represent kind of dry, well-drained conditions. Um, so that's something else we could look for. Let me show you an example. So here, here's a correlation panel through a number of wells. Um, the wells cut through a, a valley fill, what's interpreted as a valley fill um, in the orange color. There's another one down below. The blue lines in here are flooding surfaces with distinctive biostratigraphic fauna. And you'll see that this well in here penetrates um, the interval outside of the valley. And in fact, it, it penetrates a, a paleosol. So let's have a look at what that looks like in core. So here's the core. I should have said that let me just go back to this slide in here that in general, the soils that we see present in this succession of coals. So lots of organic carbon that's that requires um, preservation of that carbon requires waterlogged conditions. So high groundwater. This paleosol here, well, we do see carbonaceous material. The roots are associated with carbon in their linings, but you can see that this is mainly sort of a, a a white to pale pink color. 
And if you look at a thin section through part of this soil, what we see is it's predominantly quartz. There would have been clay in here originally, and that's been removed. And that was basically been removed by water moving down, leaching out the clays when this soil was formed. So this foil, soil took a long time to form, and it also formed when groundwater was much lower. So these are the kind of conditions we might expect to, to be associated with a soil developed lateral to a valley film. So this, this fits our, our, the model quite nicely. Okay, I, I also said that we can get erosion by, by marine processes and principally waves. So these two diagrams here uh, show, the upper diagram shows that the development of a, of a normal shore face or shore face building out under, under regression and rising or stable sea level conditions. So what we can see in here, um, here's the offshore deposits, here's the lower shore face and here is the upper shore face. And we see you know, a gradual change as we go from from deep to shallow through here. Um, so this is, if you like, is a sort of vertical succession we would expect to see um, where, where all the fascias are preserved um, within the succession. Imagine now if we lower sea level, what happens then? Well, we lower sea level, but we also lower the wave base. And that means we can have erosion, waves scouring the seabed. So two things happen here. So one is that the shore face is stepping downwards. Sometimes we call that forced regression. That's a term that you might come across. We have regression, but in this case, it's forced by a fall in sea level rather than by just having um, excess sediment. So as sea level falls, we also wave base is lowered and effectively the upper shore face deposits scour down and they rest directly on offshore deposits. So if we take a vertical section through there, we're missing the lower shore face deposits. That's, that's these deposits here on the left, they're missing on the right. So that, you know, we have a missing fascist belt, an abrupt change from relatively deep to relatively shallow, but all within shallow marine rocks. And this we could describe as a sharp based shore face. If we think about the two vertical sections in here, so one vertical section through here, one through here. The one on the left is the normal fully developed succession going from offshore to lower shore face to upper shore face. The one on the right is our sharp based shore face. Offshore deposits directly overlain by either upper shore face deposits or you know, the, the proximal parts of the lower shore face. But we're missing these interbedded sands and muds of the lower or the distal lower shore face. So just one example in here, um, here's a, core description and then gamma ray and neutron density logs. You can see the gamma ray, there's a, a sharp kick to the left here, um, indicating an abrupt increase in sand content. You also see that the neutron density logs coming close together rather abruptly, but it's actually probably most clear in the core. You know, we have predominantly siltstones and mudstones in here with some thin sandstone beds, rippled beds less than a centimetre in thickness. This is the offshore deposits. That's abruptly overlain by stacked amalgamated shore face deposits, lower shore face deposits, lots of hummocky cross stratification. And that, that abrupt contact is about here in the, in the core as we go from base moving upwards towards the left. So we're not seeing interbedding of, 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 um, of storm beds with these, these offshore deposits. There's a sharp contact between them. Okay, so those are sort of regressive surfaces. Now, now let's think about the, the transgressive, um, transgressive shallow marine deposits. We've already talked about these a little bit. We've talked about 
estuaries forming within valleys, for example. So those would be transgressive deposits. We also talked about barrier islands this morning being formed during transgression in, in wave dominated coasts. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about those barrier islands now. So here's a map view of, um, of a barrier island. This is a modern barrier island off the coast of the Netherlands. Here we have sections of barrier islands. They're, they're linear. Um, so the waves are breaking on the, the north side, so the seaward side of these barriers. We have tidal inlets cut, cut through the barrier islands. That allows the, uh, the tides to move water um, from the open ocean into a lagoon behind the barrier island. So if we take a cross section through here, what we see um, the north, so that's seaward. On the right, what we see is basically the shore face profile going from deep to shallow. Here's the barrier island, and then a shallow lagoon behind that. Okay. Now, if we think about this, this um, barrier island, this, this profile, moving that towards the left, so transgression, uh, moving that barrier island in a, in a landward direction. Well, we can get erosion at wave base, for example. That, so we can generate erosion associated with waves during transgression. We're also moving these, these tidal inlets, and that those are, you know, we move those in a landward direction as well. Those are, those are not present all the way along the coast. They occur in specific locations, but those tidal inlets can be very deep. We can imagine on this cross section in here having these deeply scoured tidal channels. And of course, if, if we move those in a landward direction, we can also have very deep local erosion at the base of those tidal channels, and we can get tidally cut erosion surfaces. So that's what this diagram at the bottom here is showing. You know, we can have erosion by waves in the shore face, and we can have erosion by tides locally associated with those tidal inlets and the, the channels that, that drain into them on the landward side in the lagoon. Um, so what that means is we can get erosion during transgression and that erosion uh, can be associated with waves or tides. So this morning um, or this morning I talked about flooding surfaces that's the abrupt deepening um, typically associated with relatively little erosion, but we can also get variants, uh, you know, variations on that on that pattern. Um, so surfaces cut during transgression associated with wave erosion or wave ravinement. Um, waves, wave bases are fairly uniform depth, so that wave erosion tends to produce planar erosion surfaces that can be very laterally extensive. Tidal erosion during transgression or, or tidal ravinement that can cut very deep localized scours but again they tend not to be widespread they just occur in, in specific locations where those tidal inlet channels are located. Okay so just the last, um, the last couple of slides in here um, just to build on that a little bit more. So again, thinking about retreating barrier islands, lagoons behind them. Here we've got two cross sections, A and B. Uh, they both go from landward on the left to seaward on the right. Landward on the left, seaward on the right. In both cases, they show regression or progradation of a shore face, probably a strand plane towards the right and then we have later transgression or retreat towards the left. This bottom example would be a case where we have low sediment supply um, and low accommodation and in that case as the barrier island retreats from right to left it moves landward it moves more or less horizontally so we can we can say this has a, a shoreline trajectory that is close to horizontal. And because we have erosion at the shore face due to waves, 
we basically develop this this really quite planar laterally extensive erosion surface in this this sort of bold black line and we preserve almost none of the lagoonal deposits behind there okay so that's what happens if, if the retreat is is more or less horizontal the top diagram shows that similar kind of retreat the shoreline moving towards the left and erosion at the shore face but in this case we have aggradation building up of sediment because we have high sediment supply and also high accommodation to preserve that sediment and in this case that the, the trajectory of that retreating shoreline it, it's climbing upwards or it's ascending okay it's no longer horizontal and that means that we can preserve the lagoonal deposits behind the retreating barrier island okay so the key thing here is that you know depending on um the angle the trajectory of the retreat we can we can either have very thin or absent transgressive deposits as in b here or we can preserve quite a large thickness of those deposits as in a here okay we'll stop there and work through an exercise uh, meeting our main group now.